Well, hello everybody and a very warm welcome to this month's question and answer webinar with me. It's just coming up to uh, gone 7 o'clock so we might as well get started. I know some of you are still coming online uh, but I think we do need to make a start. For those of you who are new to the format, essentially what will happen in this webinar is we get submitted uh, with lots of questions for the webinar um, in the, the previous month because we do these on a monthly basis and what happens in the team in the office collate um, the, the questions together and group kind of sim ones together and then put them here for me. We've decided to slightly change the format so we're just going to pick a uh, top 10 questions uh, just because um, before sometimes we were getting 50 or 60 questions and we were grouping them and sometimes we ended up with 20 or 30 groups and we decided actually we might as well go with a top 10. So you're not uh, you're not kind of over um, overburdened or anything with uh, with different questions. So we've picked the top ten questions, um, basically generally speaking on marketing, branding, and sales, but occasionally about business and wider topics as well. All questions that you want to know the answer to. Uh, and like I say, we try and cover as many as we possibly can within those groups. Now, as I say, there's a top ten, but then after that. If you can email me questions during this webinar live, um, and I'll probably tell you when I'm towards the final question, the moderator will then collate those together uh, and, and kind of give me those, and then I can answer any questions you've got live. So any questions that arise from what I'm saying, um, so you know I'm obviously talking now, and it might be interesting to you to um, uh, to, to kind of you know say what did you mean by that, or can you reclarify that, or maybe something you would have liked to have asked but you didn't submit any questions. I should say at this point as well, in the future, always feel welcome to submit as many questions as you possibly can. Like I say, whilst we often get quite a lot of them, the more we have, the more we can group together, and the more um, interesting we can make it, and the more ground we can cover. So as I say. The, the first pre-submitted 10 as I call them and then we'll answer your live questions. Now for those of you who are new to it again if you actually look in the top right hand corner there is a little button and that will make the whole screen much larger or we go into full screen mode. Some people like to watch it in a smaller screen where it just sits on the page um, that you logged into but if you want to make it bigger you can do that. Okay, and also I should say that um, if you do have any questions for next month um, after this webinar, um, we do collect them all over the uh, the 30 days, so, uh, so please do send them. We always like to uh, have a look at them. Uh, and finally, this should be being recorded, um, so anybody who has to leave early or anybody who didn't have a chance to log on should be able to listen to this, assuming technology works, which uh, it doesn't always with these live web webinars. One of the problems is it'll either work or it doesn't. Uh, and you've got no kind of choice. You, you press record and all the technology seems to work, but occasionally uh, something with uh, the live audio doesn't quite work for some reason. But um, we've recorded the last couple, no problem. So hopefully um, you'll receive this uh, as a, a kind of lasting, um, lasting video. So let's have a look at the top 10 then. And the first one says, um, my business is going nowhere. It's stuck in the mud. What can I do? Okay. I guess that, that's kind of dependent on two different variables. One variable is what's your business type and the second one is uh, what's the, the kind of reason for the problem. Because being stuck in the mud, which is a, a kind of interesting expression, can either be because the business just isn't moving anywhere um, because of a lack of motivation or it could be because of a lack of something else if you will, um, kind of somewhere else in your business. It could be that your sales isn't very good or your team isn't very good. So to some extent, I guess I'll just group those together and say I think there's only um, a couple of areas where you need to focus on business. And if any business is stuck in the mud, it's generally because there's a problem with one of these couple of areas that I'm about to mention. And you have to focus in on one of these areas because even if you're good at the other areas, if you've kind of got a problem with one area, it affects everything else. So I'll make the first area motivation. So actually having motivation, actually having a commitment to your business. Some people, it's easy to fall out of love with the business. So I think you need to reconnect with um, your what your values are for the business, but more importantly, what your ambitions are for the business. Most often when I see people who've fallen out of love with business, it's usually because they've been doing it for a long time and they've just got a little bit kind of sick of it. It's got quite tired and quite stayed. Or... Perhaps they've been involved in the business and they've tried lots of different activities and over time they haven't worked. You've kind of got to refocus, retake and say, well, what, what am I trying to achieve with the business? And then the next step is a strategy. That lack of strategy is another reason why businesses fail. So say, I've got the motivation, let's draw an action plan. Now, this doesn't have to be a 100-page strategy. In fact, I say if a strategy can't be summarized in a page, it's too long. So it's having a plan. And the plan needs to focus on certain areas of development. 
First of all, you need to be getting good at marketing. So you need to actually have branding and marketing that produces enough leads coming to your door, enough qualified inquiries. Then you need to develop your sales skills. So you convert those leads, um, those inquiries, into paid up customers. Then you need a delivery that's effective and on time and in budget. Because if you don't have any of those, then there's a problem with your product or service. Uh, and not only will that become quite stressful for you if that isn't in place for too long, but also your customers are unlikely to come back and send you referrals. And the easiest way to grow a business is to get customers to come back time and again and to bring their friends with them. Then you've got to get your staff base in. So you've actually got to have your staff supporting you. A lot of people feel quite stuck because they haven't got enough help. Now sometimes help isn't actually paid up staff, it might be outsourced. Uh, but you need kind of backup if you will. And then finally, you need to systemize your business. So you're reviewing everything, you're putting everything on autopilot, and you're kind of managing your business in that way. So I would say if you're kind of stuck in the mud, now's the time to take a full view of the whole business and really start to analyze what's going right and what's going wrong. You know, like I say, check your motivation. Um, kind of re-tap into your values and your ambitions of the business. Make sure there's a strategy. Make sure there's enough inquiries coming in. Make sure you're making enough sales. Making sure that the product delivery is good. Making sure that your, your team is supporting you and everything's working and it's systemized in the long run. If you can tick all of those boxes, then your business will start moving. But as I said before, if any one of those boxes is missing, so to speak, you're going to struggle forever. So it's really important that you make sure that it's almost like you're firing on all cylinders. And if any of those are missing, uh, then you're, you're kind of misfiring in a cylinder. So I think you need to reconnect with, uh, with the business and make sure that you've got all of the kind of fundamentals in place. Okay, the second one says, is, news, uh, is newspaper advertising worth it or dead? Well, it entirely depends. I mean, newspaper advertising um, is obviously dying. It's in the process of decline. Whether it will ever completely disappear, I don't know. I mean, maybe in 10 years' time it could all be online, maybe. Um, although I'm not so sure about that because I'm not so sure people will um, always want to pay for content, but who can predict that? Um, or it might be you just have maybe one left-wing paper, one right-wing paper, and you know, one broadsheet, one tabloid, and maybe it'll work that way. Um, who knows exactly what will happen? But they're certainly in decline and they've got to do something differently. The decline is on a national and a local level, but obviously locally it's even more felt. Um, but for the advertising, to some extent, that's a bit of an academic argument because that's about the future. And as I've said there, you can't really predict the future. But something you most certainly can't do is know what's going to happen um, for your business in the next 12 or 24 months. Because... You know, the future's well into the future, but in the immediate future, um, you know, it, it, the newspapers are not going to just, just going to die tomorrow. They're in the process of decline. So, um, you know, f producing it for the business um, and producing forecasts for the future uh, for general kind of social purposes are completely different. So you need to not really worry about is it dying and just worry is it working and will it work for the next 12, 24 months and no newspaper is really going to change so much over that period. And then advertising is all about saying, well, okay, let's go back to the three M's of marketing. Have we got a right target market? So who reads this newspaper? And there's a, a kind of significant number of those our target market. Have we got the right message? And with advertising, you're going to have to do very good advertising if it's image brand building type advertising. Um, or you'll get probably better results with direct response advertising. Or the very best is probably an advertorial. Um, so to some extent, you you know, you've got to pick the right message there and that will make a big difference. Um, and if you're kind of happy with those, the third one is just media and we know that that's this advertising. So is that the best or one of the best media for you to be using? So if enough people that you're interested in read the newspaper and you will get responses by choosing the right message in the right format, then whether or not it's slowly declining is a bit of an irrelevance. It's a bit like what I say about SEO. Obviously, SEO, I believe, is on the decline because Google are really determined to get rid of it. However, whether we're still doing SEO in 10 years' time, I don't know. But we probably still will be in, you know, five years' time. So that's a long time. A lot of businesses could be founded, uh, built up, uh, made lots of profits, and then sold within five years. So, you know, a lot of stuff in decline. You know, people say post is in decline. Will we even have a postal service in 50 years' time? Will it just be delivery of kind of heavy items well who knows but it's a little bit academic and we always get these predictions about the future wrong don't we it either happens 
you know, not on quite the scale we wanted or it's not quite as dramatic. So um, I wouldn't worry about whether it's dead or not. It's still working for plenty of people. And if it's enough of the right people reading the right newspaper for you, you know, that's a green light to do it. OK, the third question says, this is interesting. You always talk about avoiding selling on price. How? OK, uh, and that's probably me saying when you say avoiding selling on price, me saying that people aren't price sensitive or not everybody is price sensitive. And let me just put this price sensitivity kind of um, idea to bed by just looking at a couple of some things. Look at the food that people eat and ask yourself, is that the cheapest food? Is it the cheapest food per se? You know, because minced meat is much cheaper than, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, a fillet cut of something. Or even when it comes to buying, you know, these frozen lasagnas that have got the horse meat in, well, you know, there's a cheap one and a more expensive one. So within any of in a, within any of those, are people always buying the cheapest? And obviously they're not. Not everybody's buying, you know, sort of Tesco value food. That's just a myth. Or go out and have a look at the cars that are driving around, and you'll see that there's some cars which are worth. Well, probably nothing. You probably couldn't sell them for more than scrap money and other cars which are worth a few hundred thousand pounds or even more. So people don't buy on price. There are some people that buy the cheapest, some people who buy the most expensive. And I'm not saying you can't ever have success being the cheapest, but of all the business models I know, that is the worst by a humongous margin for all sorts of reasons that I've not got time to go into here. So number one, the reason I say avoid it is because it's pointless. You don't need to do it. You don't need to sell on price. What you sell on is value. So that's about progressively and continuously and never endingly addressing your customers' unmet needs. What What's their either pain that you can solve or what's their aspiration that you can um, help them to achieve. So they're kind of pain and gain. What, what are they and how can I, over time, progressively and continuously, help them to achieve that? How can I help them to address that unmet need? That differentiator, people call it a USP, a point of difference, whatever you want to call it, that kind of positioning for the business where you fundamentally solve somebody's problem. That's the first way to uh, to overcome price. And if you can become a competitor in the marketplace that actually has a business that solves more of people's problems more effectively and unremittingly, then that will make you significantly different. And if you're significantly different, people will pay a higher price for higher service. So I don't just tell people to put up their prices and charge more. I tell people to become a great provider and then they can do that. Then you need to look at, once you've delivered everything that people want, how can you make that more convenient? How can you make it more personalised? How can you make it closer to somebody and easier? Whether you go to them or whether it's a quicker service or whether it's more custom built for them. So not only are you solving that problem, that pain or gain, that unmet need, you're also doing it in a more convenient fashion. And then look at the other side, look at the reasons why people don't buy. That might be fear of loss. So you put in some social proof. Or it might be buyer's remorse or a fear of buyer's remorse. So you put in guarantees. So you put in place the ways that you differentiate yourself from other people and you're saying there isn't a risk. Look at how other people have found it. Uh, look at our guarantees. Look at our kind of, you know, 60 day money back guarantee because we know that we so comprehensively um, kind of, uh, you know, deliver this unmet need. It's difficult when I'm not de delivering an example for a uh, kind of particular business because I don't know who submitted this question, but whatever whatever your kind of unmet need is, whatever that would happen to be. And if you can never endingly address, address that kind of unmet need and make it more and more tailor-made and easy and convenient, and then you're actually very good at saying there's no risk as well, and you put all of those together and make all of your marketing messages about those factors, then you will move away from the lower end of the market and you'll put yourself as a premium top provider. And with that comes higher prices. So it's not just about, as I say, increasing prices for the sake of increasing prices. It's actually about having a strategy um, for making your business significantly better than anybody else's. And then you can avoid selling on price. Don't worry, some people will still try and negotiate. You know, if you're selling a Bentley motor car, some people will still try and get a good deal on that Bentley motor car. That's just some people's um, way of doing business. And some people will rather buy a cheaper one. Um, however, you're not after those people. And that's almost a fundamental mindset for business is to be able to turn people away, so to speak, and say, well, our business isn't compatible with your business. So don't be afraid of doing that. So essentially set your business up as a premium provider that really helps people. 
uh, and is the best in the marketplace. Instead of trying to be the cheapest in the marketplace, be the best at addressing that unmet need and you will get significant profits um, in the future. Okay, the fourth one says, you talk about remarketing, how do you start? Okay, well we did a bit of a video on this, didn't we, about the Mother's Day and uh, about remarketing and how to promote to your customers. So I'm going to assume you all know what remarketing is, but as a very quick uh, uh, sort of um, summary, it's when um, you add a little bit of code to your website. So through cookie technology, we identify website visitors and then we know who they are. So we've got their identity. And then as they journey around the Internet, what we do is we um, surf our advertisements only to people who've been onto our website. So on YouTube, for instance, which is one of the over a million uh, websites that you can do this on, and when you join it, you do it on all of them, whichever one your um, prospect goes to. So on YouTube, somebody's been to your website and there's advertisements. And making those advertisements about you because on your business, because I've been on your website, and not to somebody else who's a stranger who hasn't been on your website, is the difference between mass marketing and remarketing. Remarketing is re-putting the message. So that's the kind of a basic theory. How do you start? Um, well, you can even let us to do it for you. So just drop me an email and say, please, can we do remarketing? Uh, and we'll uh, we'll do it for a month and figure out how much it would cost you uh, to do that. Um, or you can try and set it up yourself by speaking to Google uh, and looking at the AdWords um, and asking them, um, you know, can I set up an account and then kind of mastering it and learning to do it. Um, it, it it's not something which is particularly difficult um, the actual quality of the advertisements and the message of the advertisements uh, and choosing how long to display them for is, it for is it three, four, five months or is it 18 months that's kind of where the real skill comes in rather than actually setting up the system but if I said to you would you like to be promoting um, your um, your business to all of the people who visited your website would you say yes or no? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You've worked quite hard to get them on your website. We know that you know only 1% of website visitors, if we're lucky, do something. Well, what do we do with the other 99%? Well, surfing our advertisements to them is a pretty obvious starting point. Um, but it's it's not just about doing the activities. It's about making sure, like I say, the advertisements are right and it's for the right duration. And when you do bring them back onto your website, you make sure you bring them back onto a good page that then does convert. It makes it easy. Um, so it's not a panacea. Um, it's just a, a kind of massive um, a massive aid. It's a bit like um, the latest development in a Formula One car. It will make you go faster, but you've still got to be good and you've still got to know how to drive. Um, so there's still some skill involved in it, but it is a massive um, sort of game changer um, from the, the kind of the overall um, available options viewpoint. And online marketing always does this to us. It always gives us um, significantly better uh, tools in 12 months uh, at a time than it did 12 months ago. Um, so you're always getting better innovations. I remember when online marketing was just starting and we all thought that email marketing was incredible and must be the future. And now email marketing is almost considered the poor man of online advertising, probably wrongly, you know, a bit unfairly, but uh, it's quite vanilla now. If I said to you, we're going to do something on emails, you wouldn't believe that that was cutting edge. But not long ago, it really was cutting edge. Whereas the offline activities like networking and advertising and direct mail and telemarketing haven't changed so much. Whereas online, as I say, in 12 months time, you'll get much more tools uh, at your uh, your disposal than you do now. And remarketing is just one of those. So that's that's why you've got to keep up to date with online marketing because it changes. Uh, and it always changes for the better. Um, okay, uh, question number five. Um, you talk about videos on a website. What um, What is the best way to do it? Okay, right. So, um, so you've got videos on your website. Um, what's the best way of, of creating them? I guess you're talking about formats, isn't it? Um, you know, what format video do you want? And it's not just about your homepage of a website, but I would say that's a, a pretty obvious place to have them. Um, but don't be afraid to add different videos onto different pages of your website. If you sell five different products, there's no reason why you can't produce five different videos for your product pages in a summary video. Um, but I'll just talk about homepage videos now, just for the sake of argument. On the homepage video, what you need to have um, is one of a couple of formats. The first format is a simple, what I call kind of um, short documentary. It's kind of a couple of minutes long. It's generally filmed on site. It will film your products and services. It'll film your staff at action. It'll probably interview you uh, and then people who've used your services. And it's a bit like a mini news report, a kind of, you know, a, a couple of minute kind of mini documentary. 
That style's quite old-fashioned now, however, there's nothing wrong with that style. It's still quite engaging. It's, it's you know, it's one of those ones, just because it's not the newest kid on the block doesn't make it ineffective. So you do a kind of mini-documentary that's, that's kind of a news story about your business. This is who we are, what we do, um, and some kind of action shots. Your other option is to kind of do that, but in a more impactful way through an animated video. Um, and you can be more creative because it's more cartoony, so you can be a bit more cheeky. You can get a quicker message across because you can do what you want with the characters. Um, you're presenting the same message, it's just in a slightly different way. Generally with an animated video, people watch them more, uh, and you can fit more into every minute. So that's a, a kind of a bonus. Or third, um, you can do a kind of what's known as expert positioning. Uh, this is particularly important for professional service providers, where you might have you, the expert, actually in action. So let's say you're a business coach and you deliver um, seminars um, or speeches about, I don't know, growing a business, you know, profitability or something. Then actually recording you in action uh, and putting those on your website as a credibility tool. Or the fourth option is to simply interview your um, customers. Sometimes you need to edit them down or sometimes you'll just keep them as a, a full kind of recording to, depending on how brief they are. Uh, but produce that and it's a kind of social proof one. Of course social proof can be added to the documentary type one or even on the, the third format of kind of your credibility where you're giving a speech. At the end of it you might interview people and say how they liked it. It's not that one of them is better or worse for any type of business. It really depends on what the feel of your whole website is and what your whole strategy is and um, the type of people that visit your website. But I would pick one of those different formats. And like I say, start with a video on your homepage, but there's no reason why you can't have more. And quite often when you're negotiating deals with, um, with um, video production, you can actually um, quite effectively get something um, for say five different pages of your website maybe some 30 40 second ones and an overall one for not much more because what's quite expensive is coming up with the ideas and using the footage and quite often you'll cut away a lot of the footage because you're trying to condense a you know two hours of filming into two minutes a lot of those extra bits could have been used on different pages so when you do kind of look at this you know strategically ask well could i produce more Essentially, videos are just more engaging. We know that they're higher converting. We know people prefer to watch them and read, or most people do. Uh, a lot of people will say they prefer to read something because they want to appear more cerebral. But actually, we know from split testing that videos work as a conversion tool better than anything else. Um, so there's lots of incentives to, to get it right. And, um, and the price of video is coming down all the time as well. Gone are the days where, um, you know, when I first started doing videos, we used to talk about um, a £1,000 a minute, um, you know, it, 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 it's it's not ever a thousand pounds a minute anymore um so um yeah gone go of those days it is more affordable now which um you know which I, I guess makes it more available to people okay this one says um what is a good response rate to an advert okay the problem with quoting good and bad response rates is very a little bit flawed because if i put an advert in the newspaper and it was an advert towards um, older people, um, who are most of the people that read local newspapers. And it gave people um, a free token for fish and chips at my fish and chip shop. Um, I would expect a significantly better response rate than if I was promoting, um, say, a cruise um, around the world cruise um, and I was giving people a 15% discount if they um, respond by you know, the end of a week because a free token for fish and chips is significantly more uh, attractive to an older audience than a cruise is uh, because a cruise is a lot more expensive and is a lot more of a considered purchase. They're both applicable to the really, um, older market so to speak, the more mature market and they're both um, you know, perfectly good for newspaper advertising and you'll get responses from both of them but you'd expect one to outperform massively the other. And that's the problem with quoting a good or bad response rate. However, to some extent, you could probably look at a range and say what's the lower and what's the upper range. And for advertising, you know, it, if, we, if we talk about newspaper advertising, anything from 0 0.25 up to a couple of percent is good, and any more than that is probably unrealistic. Um, when it comes to billboard advertising, you're looking at even less. Um, the biggest problem is you don't know how many people look at a billboard. People estimate it, but even then, it's, these estimates are quite flawed and it's on quite old data. But 0.01% wouldn't be um, ridiculous in that type of uh, scenario. TV and radio, 
Um, again, it, it, it's so dependent on how applicable that is because some people do mass advertising. Um, you ever just do something on ITV uh, when the, the soap operas are on, which is quite kind of imprecise. Or some people um, will go onto the sports channel and advertise their rugby product during the rugby. So then, because of the different variables involved, it's quite difficult to, to kind of estimate. And again, you're estimating on the number of people you're watching. Whereas with a newspaper, you've got a bit more of a magazine or a trade um, advert. You've got more of an es a kind of a more of an accurate estimate, uh, at least of distribution and purchase. Um, that's advertising. If we look at online advertising, um, really from pay-per-click, you, you, you're looking, a good click-free rate would be 2.5% on average. Again, all of these are, are complete averages. Any less than that, you could probably optimize your performance. Um, and then if you were to look at display advertising, um, then you'd be looking again, and 0 0.01 is, is quite acceptable for that sort of stuff. Um, if we look at remarketing, another form of online advertising, really you, you're looking at your total spend and what return you get because you don't know how many people have visited your website you don't know the reasons why they're they're not staying on your website so that one's a bit more of a, a difficult one to put any any particular numbers on plus it's such a new medium nobody really knows so there are probably some general figures and what you're probably learning from that is that they're not very high um, and they can be very low um, people often talk to me about getting a 10 or 20 percent response rate and there are campaigns where you can get a 10 or 20 percent response rate you know I've done that on campaigns and it and it's great but it's out of the ordinary and you're not really expecting it um, and if you have to get 10 percent response rate uh, to make any profit then you know you're probably um, gonna be at a, at a pretty uh, pretty big risk area because it's very unlikely to happen like I say I've done it it does happen but it's more you know, every everything just works on the day, and you get a great advert, and uh, and it performs really well. But it's it's the exception that proves the rule almost. So um, don't get over excited with um, with kind of potential response rates. That's for advertising, uh, and like I say, you know, if you're giving away fr um, free tokens for fish and chips, or or um, you know, a small discount for a cruise, you'll get significantly different responses. Doesn't mean you get different profits, of course. Um, so. Um, so yeah, that's what I, whilst I don't like to give people kind of estimates, that's probably something just to have an entire kind of ballpark so you know what you're up to. So if you're getting 2% from advertising and you believe that's bad, well actually, you know, you, you probably know it's pretty good. But if you're getting no responses, then obviously you know there's a problem. This one says, um, how do you um, calculate customer lifetime value like in the video you produced? Um, I guess that one's it's a bit of a, a broad question, isn't it? He's saying, how do you calculate it? Um, essentially, what you do is you look at um, one of the different ways I explored, one of the different ways of calculating um, your customer lifetime value. So split all of your customers individually. So let's say you have 100 customers. Figure out everything that they've spent with you over time. So some customers might have spent £10, others a million. Add them all together and divide it by the number. So compute an average, and that's your customer lifetime value. So I've got 100 customers, you know, and they've all spent you know, some £10, some a million pounds, but the average spend, so the average customer lifetime value is £200. Let's say your profit margin is 25%, so 25% of £200 is £25 net profit. So your customer lifetime value is £25 net profit. Um, it's as simple as that. It, 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 it's not supposed to be rocket science. Um, it's just designed to say, here are all my customers. What on average do they spend? And what does that mean overall for the business in terms of profit? And then that's the number you work with. So if you know that your net profit uh, customer lifetime value is £25, well, you know you can't afford to spend very much on marketing. Because if you spend £26 or more, you've lost Whereas if it's two and a half thousand pounds, well, you're more in business. You can afford to do a lot more. If it's twenty five thousand pounds, then you can afford to do even more. If it's quarter of a million, well, obviously it's a very premium uh, service, and you could really afford to do a great deal of marketing. But if you know how much income on average a customer gives you, you can decide how much to spend on marketing. So don't get wrapped up in the theory of accounting and worrying about how you know what's the sensitivity analysis on this and what's the stress ability. Just you know. Don't worry about any of that. Just, just simply run your calculations, or get somebody to do it for you. Ask us to do it, and we'll, you know, get that figure, and then that determines how much you can spend. Don't worry about the theory behind it, or any any kind of um, uh, any of those kind of academic calculations that are irrelevant. Okay, this one says uh, my website isn't working. What can I do? Um, 
Well, you can kind of go through the checklist of, of what needs to work on a website, really. Um, <laughs> but the biggest mistake people make, um, because I normally uh, get asked this question uh, probably, um, I don't know, uh, maybe five times or ten times a week. And I normally say to people, well, you need to um, go through all of the stuff you're doing on your website and you know make sure that uh, the website's... Um, um, kind of fitting of your brand so it looks like a, the right business and make sure uh, that you've got good imagery and make sure you've got data capture make sure these headlines and benefits make sure it's readable and the text is split up make sure there's a call to action use a video um, you know implement remarketing implement um, kind of IP identification implement all of these different activities however of those five or ten times I'm asked this question during uh, the course of my normal kind of business week and I tell people that um, I then look into more detail and I find that they're not getting any traffic to the website. So whilst you want a high performing website, sometimes that isn't the reason that it, that it isn't working, it's actually a lack of traffic. So I would say the first something is look at your Google Analytics and if you've not got Google Analytics uh, or any other analytics package then you know you, you can't analyse your website, so you need to put it onto your website and wait 30 days. Uh, and then see the results. But look at your analytics and look at the volume of traffic. And if you have got enough traffic, do all of the stuff I just mentioned, like putting videos on and data capture and calls to action and benefits and readability and headlines and all the rest of it. But if not, actually sort out your traffic sources. Now, if we're talking just about online, well, is that SEO? So do we need to optimize the website? Or would we be better doing pay-per-click? Or would we be better doing social media promotions? Or would we be better doing email marketing? Or could we do some form of um, display and banner advertising online? Um, you know, could we do offline promotions like newspaper advertising or um, postcards and direct mail, sending people to our website for a particular purpose? You know, Claim your great offer at www.ourgreatoffer.com. So... Instead of looking necessarily at, is your website working, is it the design, and is it the way the website's constructed, say, am I getting enough traffic? And if um, if you're not getting, say, a 1,000 hits a month, you're in trouble, really, because we know that only about 1% of website visitors ever do anything. I believe that can become massively higher by, or I know that can become massively higher, by applying all of the kind of optimization tactics that I've briefly alluded to in this video. However, if you're not... Um, if you're not getting enough traffic, you know, 1% of, um, of of that kind of 1,000 visitors is still only 10 kind of sales. Um, you've got a problem. You, your numbers just aren't right. Okay, you might increase that to 5%, um, but even if you, you know, even then it's not a huge amount, is it? It's not hugely exciting to know that you've got only a 5% kind of capture. Um, so you've got to be realistic about it, and if you've not got enough traffic, like I say, look at the different sources of driving traffic. Uh, and then if you do decide, well, it, it, it's probably email marketing, well, look at the videos we've done on email marketing and apply those. Or if it's pay-per-click, again, look at those videos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, two ways your website isn't working. Not enough people are looking at it, major problem. Or actually, uh, the website's not constructed properly. Well, less major problem because it's quite easy to solve. Um, you know, you just got to be dedicated and decide to do it, whereas most people stick with a bad performing website. Um, but just because it isn't working doesn't necessarily mean it's your website. Make traffic and then make conversion. It's kind of um, they're quite important bedfellows. The next one says, I'm a new business, where should I start? Okay. Um, you probably start by not worrying too much about everything else that you could possibly be doing and not worrying too much about the future and just kind of saying, let's look at the next 30 days and let's make something happen. Most new businesses I meet are always telling me how wealthy they're going to become. Uh, and they do a lot of spreadsheets about how wealthy they're going to be. And they spend uh, six months waiting for a website uh, and then another six months getting business cards printed and it's a year later and they still haven't done anything. So what you need to do is kind of shorten the lifespan and say, we're only a new business for 30 days. Let's do something in 30 days. So what would that something be? Well, step number one, it would be saying, well, who's our target market? And just go after one niche. Forget several niches. Forget several target markets. Really identify exactly who it is, whether it's middle-aged men in in Newcastle um, for your, your I don't know, um, a bar that's the target market or whether it's um, you know uh, solicitors for a particular uh, training course you know whatever type of business you've got select your target market have one niche figure out um, at least 10 benefits of working with that niche figure out what their unmet need is and then make all of your messages around here are the benefits and here's what we can do for you add a guarantee 
Uh, make sure you're not pricing just to get the cheap work in. Make sure you're pricing in a sensible way so you don't become a busy fool very quickly. Sort of new businesses give stuff away almost for free and are massively oversubscribed. Make sure the pricing makes sense. And then say, well, if that's my target market, you know, these middle-aged men or these solicitors, that's their unmet need and this is how to communicate. Figure out where they go. I always say, where does your niche hang out? And go where your niche hangs out. So figure out if it is for solicitors, okay. Well, if they go to these types of events, they read this type of stuff, they're in these offices so I can send the information. Or again with the, the, the kind of middle-aged person for your bar uh, that I just outlined. Find out the easiest way to reach them. And if the activities you've got to do take more than 30 days to reach, I would probably choose some quicker ones. Even, even the longer one, they might not be the ones you stick with but shorten the lifespan and kind of really focus in that way and say, well, that's my target market. That's my message. That's my USP. That's my pricing. They're the benefits of working with me. What's the best way of communicating that particular message to my target market? And how can I do that in 30 days or less? If you shorten the lifespan and just say, we're going to get on with it and do it, you won't be in that situation where you're waiting forever to build stuff. You know, and, and also another point about people who are waiting six months to get business cards and websites done and all the rest of it. You know, just do something that's simpler that can be done in two or three days. There's plenty of people that will turn you around something in two or three days. You don't have to stick with it forever, but action is the quickest way to make a new business into a, a kind of, you know, small uh, and burgeoning success. And then you can start to worry about kind of more long term activities. So kind of shorten the lifespan and invest. Remember the video we did as well about the kind of 20 um, different um, no cost uh, or, or pretty much zero cost marketing tactics and they're probably quite useful for a new business that might not have a marketing budget um, so you know it doesn't always have to cost you something um, you know going out and public speaking and writing and blogging and uh, social media and all of that sort of stuff or even email which is a very small cost um, are all options to you it doesn't have to be massive advertising and you yeah, have a number of new businesses I meet and they say in their first month they've spent their marketing budget for the year well, it was completely the wrong format anyway. You should have spent the first 30 days budget getting in enough sales to be able to afford to do proper marketing months two onwards and keep growing the business. If you spent all of your money, that means in the next whole year, number one, it didn't work because you didn't get enough revenue in, but number two, you can't afford to grow, so you'll be a new business for a whole year. Kind of recalibrate and say, I'm only a, a, kind of a, a new business for a, a relatively short time period and just focus on action. Far too many business people don't take action. You know, nothing happens until we do something. Um, and, and, and too many people kind of miss that. So number one, action works anyway. But in a new business, every every hour is precious because there's no income coming in. And whatever means you have to support yourself, they're not going to last forever. Uh, or the, even if you're financially comfortable, the business just it, it won't gain any momentum. So it's a kind of an immediate 30-day launch. And I always think that's the best approach for any um, any new business. Okay, the tenth and final pre-submitted one says, um, I put a free report on my website, but it didn't work. Okay, um, it's a bit like the previous question, wasn't it, we had? Um, I'm, I'm minded to say to you, okay, well, instead of giving away a free report, why not make it something of more value? So why not make it a free booklet? Why not make it a free printed report? Why not make it a free um, kind of book publication? Why not make it a free seminar place? Why not make it a free consultation? Why not bundle it as a kind of box set of a free consultation, a DVD, and a free report, etc., etc.? Make sure the, the, the free report really resonates with your target market and it actually is something that people want to read best way of testing these free reports, by the way, um, is offering them to your existing customers and say, would this be of value? And don't let them placate you and go, oh, thanks very much for giving me something free of charge. Say, you know, what would be interesting? Or ask your customers, what would you really like to know about what we do? And kind of compute that into your free giveaway. But like I say, it's tempting for me to talk about that as I normally would. But it might be that it is that the free report is working. Uh, or however you're doing it, you're saying a free report in this particular question. It might be that is working, you've not got enough traffic. We'd only ever expect 1% or 2% of people to download this anyway. So again, it goes back to what we said in the, the previous few, uh, uh, question, you know, two questions ago. What is, um, what is the, the analytics and what are the numbers like? And if it's not at least 1,000 hits a month, well, we know that even on 2%, you know, that would only be, what, 20 people. Um, so before we say it's not working, uh, we've got to figure out, is there enough traffic? Um, and if there isn't, you go back to the question, uh, or well, the response I gave to question number eight about the website. Um, you know, this is this is what you need to do: drive more traffic to the website. Because the more people on the website, there it is. And also, when you are promoting the website, it's sometimes easier to promote your free giveaways. You know, visit our website for this than it is to do anything else. So before you say it isn't working, make sure that you're promoting it and you're getting enough traffic. 
if it is the case and it's still not working, we'll revert to what I said there and do it that way. Giving away information for free on a website doesn't always work, but it is one of those um, kind of most effective strategies, if you will. If, if I was to list my top 10 all-time most effective strategies um, that are applicable to most businesses, uh, for most target markets, in most economies, at most prices, etc., etc., um, you know, this would be not only on the list, but somewhere towards the top of the list. Um, nothing's ever guaranteed to work, but if you put everything in a, a kind of sensible order, it's much more likely to work, and that is one of my favourite tactics. So, um, you know, check your traffic sources before you worry about anything else. Okay, then, well, that brings us um, to the end of those kind of top ten, if you will, the pre-submitted ones. Um, so now we will look at the live submitted ones, which means anybody listening to a recording of this, unfortunately we can't capture these uh, for, for technical reasons.